I would like to thank the church member, friend, and fellow Christian for suggesting this topic, light and darkness. It's been eye-opening for me to see how God uses light and darkness all throughout Scripture, starting from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through the final chapter of the book of Revelation. And this contrast is fascinating, and it's going to make a great topic to review. So please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles. I'm going to read out of the book of John chapter 8. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So very, very important to understand that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Uh, you can say literally, but to Christians also the spiritual significance is extremely important. So I'm going to discuss at length the light of the world versus, let's say, the darkness of this world, which tries to counterfeit the light of the world at times. So what I'm going to talk about is, I'm going to first start off with spiritual vocabulary that all Christians need to understand this topic. Uh, I'm going to talk about how God divides light and darkness. God's light, uh, you will die and then live forever. And a lot of people, when they have near-death experiences, they talk about being drawn to the light. But ultimately, what's important is what Jesus Christ says, that uh, we have Moses and the prophets. In other words, you are born again of the Spirit. And any experiences, near death or not, what matters is you're saved because there is a light in a counterfeit light. And I'm going to talk about that more in this presentation. The counterfeit light, you will die forever. If, if you have counterfeit light in your life, you're walking in darkness. And I'm going to show some examples from Scripture. Uh, I'm going to talk about how God blinded Saul, Moses, moles, bats, using scales. Ultimately, this delusion comes from the Most High, and it serves a purpose and a lesson for the rest of us. I'm going to talk about how Christians should have night vision. We live in a world of darkness, but we have vision by the power of Jesus Christ because we are born again of the Spirit. What does that vision mean? I'm going to talk about creatures of the night. God talks about uh, this very subject, and there is a literal as well as a spiritual lesson here. I'm going to talk about the importance of understanding what gifts are. Uh, gifts, I will just cover the topic of uh, a Christ, false Christ or true Christ. I referenced one passage of scripture there, but I'm going to get into this subject a little bit. And then I'm going to lead up to a conclusion called Wormwood, a false light of darkness. This is a major topic God is giving us throughout his word. He's contrasting light with darkness. And he's telling us that the God of this world has blinded the minds of basically the heathens and is trying to counterfeit him. So there is a false light of darkness that uh, is ultimately going to be served up as a delusion before the return of Jesus Christ. And then I'll wrap this up and give a conclusion that will end on a positive note about the importance of the light of the gospel. So first I'm going to talk about spiritual vocabulary. I have covered this topic extensively in many previous videos. I would invite people to pray and study your Bibles, look for cross-references, feel free to use some of the video materials out there uh, regarding spiritual vocabulary that I previously put out. Um, but a tree is symbolic of a person or a man. A cloud is a prophet. Now, clouds can be false prophets or prophets from God. 
A house is symbolic of faith. It says that in the New Testament, household of faith. I means that you have wisdom. You either have the wisdom of the world, which is when you have your literal, natural eyes, you judge by your appearance. But when you're born again of the Spirit and you've got spiritual vision, spiritual eyes, you don't judge by appearance. You judge a righteous judgment by God's prophets and his instructions through an unbroken testimony. So I is symbolic of wisdom. You either have the world's wisdom or you have God's wisdom. Light would be knowledge. Knowledge from God's word. You're sober. You've got life. You've got the son of righteousness with healing. He's healing you from being sick. His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the true light. The counterfeit light would be the darkness of this world. Satan, famine, the Babylonian word, all the corrupt words, the corrupt Bibles, being drunk, having eternal death, walking in death, not knowing, having no vision. You're in darkness. A lamp is a Bible. It could be God's word. It could be a counterfeit word. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the anointing that we get when we're saved is from God. And you have to have oil in your lamps, lamps or Bibles, to be saved and enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I've covered that subject extensively in other videos. But as Christians, everyone should be studying and reading their Bibles independently. My prayers and hopes are that you're using these videos as a tool to further enhance your Bible study, but just that as a tool, not as a sole resource. Fire, symbolic of words, God's words or counterfeit words. Shadow, blocking of light. Either God's light or the Babylonian counterfeit light, which is really darkness according to God's spiritual testimony. And then smoke, more blocking of light. Uh, God's light or Babylon's light. Um, but smoke is, under, uh, is important to understand what smoke is symbolic of. And then a gift. Gift is symbolic of a Christ. True Christ or false Christ? Jesus Christ or Leviathan? Uh, pure words, corrupt words. Bibles that are true, Bibles that are false. Uh, so there's a term called a gift. In Genesis chapter 1, And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So, Early on in God's word, going in four verses, he's already telling us about light and darkness, how he divided it. And he's associating light being good, and he divided from the darkness. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus Christ says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Jesus Christ is reminding us, of what he told us back in Genesis chapter 1. He comes to divide, and his division is because of his word. And his word is, he is the light of the world, and he is dividing against darkness. He's dividing against anyone that's not walking in the truth. In John chapter 8 it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Meaning, if you are born again of the Spirit, and you are following Jesus Christ, you have the light of life, eternal life, in the kingdom of heaven. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, division is a common theme when it comes to light and darkness. God divides these two. And that sets up a very important lesson that I'm going to proceed with here. So one example that this um, gentleman uh, and I have collaborated on this particular sermon, he brought to my attention a number of passages out of Scripture 
one of which is in Exodus chapter 14, where uh, Israel was being released from captivity in Egypt. And it says in verse 20, And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them. So I'm going to stop and comment. Earlier I mentioned that a cloud is symbolic of a prophet. So the, the word of God uh, was not perceived by the Egyptians. The Egyptians represent the Babylonians and heathens. I'm going to get to that shortly. Uh, so God's word blinded Pharaoh and gave light to Israel. Okay? Light by night. So certainly there is a literal true account going on here, but the spiritual lesson is that the Egyptians are never going to hear the voice of ultimately Jesus Christ. Okay? So, but it gave light by night to these, meaning Israel, so that the one came not near the other all night, all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The sea represents the people in the world as well. You know, the Red Sea, the Babylonians, that's what the spiritual symbolism is. We know that this literally happened as well. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind, which represents doctrine, contrary to the Egyptians that were coming after um, the Israelites. The strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So again, division happens. We know that water is symbolic of the word of God. Jesus says, by my words are ye clean, and he talks about washing us with the water of the word. So water, when it's bitter, it's bad, but when it's pure and sweet, it's good. So the waters were divided, and the people of Israel had dry land to walk upon, and those that have read the account of Exodus chapter 14 onward know what happened. I'm not going to get sidetracked here, but God saved his people from the Babylonian delusions and captivity that they were in. What does that mean spiritually? The prince of Babylon, today we know the prince is the Pope of Rome, uh, otherwise known as Pharaoh, Leviathan, etc., live in a world of darkness, and they are given power to deceive the world. The God of this world, Lucifer, is emulating the Most High, and God, the good news is, will free those in captivity that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Egyptians are wallowing in darkness because they don't believe God's word. To this very day, there is so many... There are so many corrupt Bibles, we can't even keep track of them. And I'll get to that subject uh, in a short while as well. So the Egyptians are known as heathens, spiritually throughout Scripture. Babylonians that just love darkness. They love to judge by what they see with their own natural sight, not what God's instructions or words tell them. And all of us are born unto trouble, so we should first pray for all those that are lost. Have compassion on them, even the most evil people on earth. Let's pray for them that God would open their eyes. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a result of disobedience to the word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So God calls them bats, moles, and he uses the term mouse as well, to, just as a few terms, because these are creatures of the night that love darkness, and they thrive in darkness. They don't have the light of the word in them. And that's important that we have this understanding as we read God's word so we can receive spiritual things. In Matthew chapter 17, it says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So God is demonstrating that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He is physically transforming 
and showing light. But the important thing for us is not only to believe that natural real account, but to understand the spiritual significance that Jesus is the light of the world and he gives spiritual vision to those that put their trust in him and believe on him. And this was another great example um, that my friend gave me to contrast light and darkness, that Jesus is the light of the world. So I wanted to put an illustration up to show, first and foremost, the power of Jesus Christ. He blocks the bad light from the false Christ that are always in the world. Antichrist is always here. And he gives us his light. So he blocks the bad light, which is really darkness, and he provides good light, which is also the shade from the false Christ, to those that have faith, that are in the household of faith. In Psalm 121 it says, The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, he is like a tree of life that will keep you from the power of Satan. From all this trust in your own wisdom uh, nonsense that the devil tries to keep spewing out to people. And unfortunately gets away with it the vast majority of the time. So I think this illustration may help some understand what's going on here. Uh, and just to give some further examples, you know, if you have faith and you trust in Jesus Christ, he'll teach you by his power and his word that the Vatican is spiritually Sodom in Egypt, a country and a city that sits on seven mountains, and is the whore of Babylon. And they corrupt the word of God, and their text is found, alignments to their text is found in virtually all counterfeit in all counterfeit Bibles, which are almost every Bible today. Uh, and uh, we know that because we have faith. Uh, they'll say something about, uh, well, God tells us that all of us are going to have tribulation in the world. He, he mentions that maybe a couple dozen times in Scripture. He teaches us about other names of Lucifer, such as Behemoth. Uh, he tells us that few who say they're Christians are saved because they can only say Jesus is the Lord by the Holy Ghost. So in other words, you can only confess Jesus is the Lord if you're saved by the power of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, heathens can say that phrase naturally out of their natural mouths all day long and never be saved. So God tells us that only a spiritually reborn Christian can save that. And God also teaches us about the corruptions and snares of men's wisdom found in seminaries. He tells us no man needs to teach you. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, which he sends to us, will lead us to all truth. Who believes Jesus? Few. So this is just an example uh, pictorially of Jesus Christ blocking the wisdom of the world from the false Christ and all the teachings and all the flatteries that are found in so-called professing Christianity. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It says in John chapter 1, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Again, God is dividing light from darkness. We can think of our flesh as darkness. The light comes into us, and we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that process, God is dividing our spirit from our flesh. Okay, And we are now leaning on the Lord Jesus Christ rather than our own understanding and uh, that we get from the false Christ of the world, ultimately. Uh, so this is another great contrast in God dividing the light from the darkness and telling us that Jesus Christ is the source of his light. John chapter 3, verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, 
because their deeds were evil. If you're still in the flesh and you have not been born of God's spirit, you're loving darkness. And only God can give permission, only God the Father can give permission for you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And nobody's going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ without God taking the hardness of, off of your heart. Um, and no man is going to come to God the Father except through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, unfortunately, the snare in this world is we just, on a natural level, love darkness rather than light because our deeds are evil. Uh, a lot of us have mischief that happens literally in darkness, probably more thefts, more fornication, more murder, more bad things happen during the darkness than they do during the day. Uh, and at the same time, spiritually, we just can't believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Yea, hath God said. That is the snare of mankind. But God is merciful. And his mercy is found in John chapter 3. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, just to reiterate very important parts of this, is that uh, Jesus Christ did not come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. All of us in the flesh are condemned already. We're all born unto trouble. We're all children of the devil. And none of us seek after God if you believe the Lord Jesus Christ. God chooses those he has mercy on, and he takes the hardness off of our hearts, and he draws us near to him. But God's mercy endureth forever. So if, if you know someone that is not saved, pray for them and feed them with the truth of the gospel. And God, only God can take the hardness off of a person's heart. He has to ultimately uh, engage them in believing on the truth. Uh, yes, people have free will, but just because you witness to somebody, you may witness to a hundred people and only one of them might be convicted. That's the world that we live in. And make sure if you're witnessing to someone that you're a saved Christian that's in the Word of God. Because a lot of these people that think they're Christians that start witnessing to people that have unclean spirits uh, might get attacked and do get attacked. You don't hear about that that often because our media is controlled by the prince and power of the air, Lucifer, the god of this world. That's what Jesus Christ says. That's not me. That's coming from the word of God. Darkness does not comprehend the light of the gospel as I already talked about in John chapter 1, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, as I talked about, you, you can't live in darkness and be an unsaved person in the flesh and receive the light of the, of the gospel. You have to be born again. You must be born again. Um, it says in Job chapter 41, regarding Antichrist, his scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. Uh, the scales of Leviathan, the false Christ, blind the people on earth. I show an image of a face below with scales over the eyes. And I'm going to go to another account in scripture involving Saul of Tarsus in a short while here and talk about that further. But that's how we're born. We are born trusting our own vision and not understanding what God's counsels are. We don't have spiritual sight. We trust our natural sight. And the devil has been given power by the Most High to deceive the whole world and to promote our individual trusting in our own wisdom and in our own natural vision. Saul of Tarsus gets saved by Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9, in verse 18, it says, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. 
God is reminding us that Saul of Tarsus was under the power of Satan. He had no spiritual vision until Jesus appeared to him and blinded him. Ultimately, natural, in a literal sense, he was blinded, but it sets up a critical spiritual lesson. Saul was always blind spiritually. Jesus does things naturally to teach us spiritual lessons. For example, Jesus heals the sick. Uh, to teach us about how people get saved spiritually. And in this case, Jesus, naturally blinded by his power, gave Saul a, a blindness of his natural eyes to tell us this guy is blind, We're, he's going to get saved and get edified. I think it was Ananias who edified him. And then he will receive his vision spiritually. So that is a, an important lesson that... Saul was in darkness. He couldn't see anything when he was blind. And God caused that. And then God ultimately gave him the light of the gospel. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but uh, Saul became known as Paul, the apostle, who outworked all of them. And uh, very, very great account, uh, again, suggested by a, uh, a friend of mine who was also a member of the church. Lucifer wants to kill faith. So while God is calling few to the light of Jesus Christ and few are getting saved, Lucifer wants to kill faith in this whole world and even try to cast doubt on those that are getting saved as well. In Luke chapter 18 it says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. A truly horrifying statement made by Jesus Christ asking us, is there anybody that's going to believe his word when he cometh? Something for all of us to give a lot of thought to. It shows the power of God's word to tell us about how devastating the famine is of God's word and how much power his servant, the king of Babylon, has been given to deceive the world by casting doubt on the truth of God's word, which is the light of the world. Okay, so we need to believe God's word when it comes to judging everything, including Christianity. So I'm going to show a, another illustration of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and how Lucifer tries to counterfeit uh and block the light of the world by casting doubt on the word of God. So in Luke chapter 1 it says, To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. That's the purpose of Jesus Christ, that we're all sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. In the Song of Solomon it says, I sat down under his shadow. These are people that are sitting in the shadow of death. Okay, And they're eating the wisdom, the apples of wisdom, the apples of gold, of Lucifer. And they're sick as a result because they're drunk in the night and they're sleeping in the night. And they fall asleep in that uh, chapter of the song. And they're, you know, the Antichrist charges the, the, the daughters of Jerusalem not to stir them up nor wake them until she please, the drunk woman in his arms. You know, Tell the woman what she wants to hear. Let her be drunk and drunk in the night. That's what's going on, and that's why we need every word of God. Every word of God is pure. You got a wildly different testimony in the 1611 Bible than what people think the King James Bible is. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The serpent is subtle. Okay? So I wanted to give this illustration here because... People are sitting in darkness. They think they have faith. They think they're in the household of faith, but they don't know what's going on in this world. So some of the examples I'm going to give that people sitting in darkness might believe would be, well, Jesus gave us many different Bibles. When Jesus was here, he must have given all these different accounts of truth. He spoke out of his mouth 95 different ways because we got 95 different Bibles in one language. That, that's the wisdom of the world. Or, or God's word is in the hand of the scribes. Only they know what God said. You know, all this nonsense. Um, 
the Vatican's part of Christianity, which which is laughable. The Vatican says you can buy your way to heaven, and that God's impressed by your righteous deeds. I, and, and I've got other videos on the Vatican that uh, people can can search out on this channel. But this is another part of the nonsense. Why do you see our presidents going and visiting the Pope? Why is everybody kissing his ring that has power in this world? Something to pray about. Uh, we're not going to have tribulation. We got this thing called the pre-tribulation rapture package that we're going to sell you. And it's going to make you feel wonderful. Welcome to the big wide family of Christianity. Uh, Earth does not have four corners. No, we live on a spinning ball. I'm not going to make a big doctrine about this, but you know, we, we don't, we're, we're just a small part of this wide big universe. Uh, there must be aliens from other planets coming and visiting us, and they could be brothers in Christ. We don't know. Uh, that's, that's more nonsense, more vain babbling from the Babylonians. Um, behemoth, well, it's an animal. It's a hippo, we think, or maybe a dinosaur. We're not sure. There's no word in Hebrew. Uh, everyone who says they're a Christian is saved because they say Jesus is Lord. Sorry about the typo there. Um, you know, so trust the televangelists. They all say Jesus is Lord, so everybody must be saved. Uh, seminaries are good places of learning. God drew me to the seminary, blah, blah, blah. Well, God didn't draw anybody to the seminary. He says no man needs to teach you. He says the wisdom of the world is foolish to him. He says few get saved. And out of that few, all slumbered and slept. And will he even find a saved person when he cometh? If you believe what Jesus says, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith. Faith is the only way to please God, and faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you've got a huge contrast between the darkness of the world and the light of Jesus Christ. And the light of Jesus Christ is allowed to be blocked by Lucifer, the god of this world, to cast darkness and doubt on the word. He's God's servant. So this is the, the nonsense that we have in professing Christianity today. It says in Isaiah chapter 2, In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. Uh, you make your own God, you corrupt the word, you make your own idol, your false Bible. Uh, it'll be cast to the moles and the bats, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, people without any light. They love darkness. That's the lesson here, spiritually. So I wanted to put this slide up as a follow-up to what I uh, showed earlier about the identity of the people in Babylonian captivity. Just to give some examples just a few examples um, that, and I'm going to ask everyone to refer to the Catholic New American Bible of 1987 or other Catholic Bibles, but this is generally what the teachings are. You get a subject like Behemoth out of Job 40. What Jesus Christ teaches out of the AV 1611 is he's teaching us about the King of Babylon. Sorry for the typo again, but uh, He's teaching us about Lucifer, and every verse, starting from verse 15 onward to, I think it's verse 24, teaches us about how Lucifer manipulates men and gives corrupt wisdom, ultimately that will be placed on a propaganda campaign by his antichrist, Leviathan. Okay? And what does Rome teach? Well, you know, God must be talking about a hippopotamus or a dinosaur. Or maybe a monster of chaos. We just don't know. There's no certainty. It's We always change our minds. That's the wisdom of the world, guys. And that permeates and is found virtually almost 100% of all professing Christianity. Okay? Uh, Leviathan is the visible antichrist of the Babylonian church, which is the church of Satan. But again, they teach about, you know, Leviathan must be a crocodile or a dinosaur. Uh... My comments would be, well, God teaches us that it's just Antichrist. He's counterfeiting God's word out of his mouth, go burning lamps. And, you know, you see all these false Bibles. And I name a few there, and they, they all have corrupt testimonies. There's no discernment. There's nothing in them that has any spiritual light at all. You corrupt, start corrupting God's word at all, and uh, your light will be put out. 
Uh, the horse leech is just in reference to the Church of Babylon, but, you know, the world just talks about leeches, or, you know, just like natural leeches, because they have a natural understanding. Uh, the daughters of the horse leech are Jerusalem and Samaria. Uh, the world just doesn't know that this baby leech is usually named Give and Give, but, you know, you got all different views in all these false Bibles. Song of Solomon is about the building of the image of the beast, which is a final book of wisdom. Uh, you know, you get the, the Rome uh, love song allegory of Christ in the church. Well, which Christ in which church? It would be my comment. Uh, Babylon, a city and a country on seven mountains. Uh, the world, yeah, it's Rome for sure. For sure it's Rome, but not the new improved Rome today. Probably the Rome around the time of Nero. We can't be sure, but trust in us. We, our scholars, are working night and day. Yes, we have copyrights. Yes, we're making a ton of money, but we're, God is rewarding us because we care so much about you. That's the world giving counsel. And virtually 100% of our pastors have hooks in their mouths and are on, uh, fish on for this nonsense. Okay, all agree Rome is Babylon, by the way. God has at least given natural people that understanding. I mean, if you don't even have that understanding, I would ask people to pray about it. Mark of the Beast, uh, God's spiritual mark from the, from the oath that Solomon's book of wisdom is the word of God. This is a very basic teaching throughout the 1611, but it's not found at all in non-1611 Bibles. Uh, what does the world say? Like the Church of Rome says, well, it's probably a stamp, uh, probably around the time of Nero. It's going to be forced for people to take it, but it probably is already in the past. We don't know, you know, uh, Winter is, is gone. You know, we just look forward to the flowers of spring. It's all bright ahead of us. Uh, so they, they talk about taking the mark of the beast and all this nonsense. So I'm not going to get off on a long tangent here. I just wanted to show light as God defines it versus the darkness of the world. You've got division here, a clear division of understanding. Who are you following? Few follow Jesus Christ in the light. Because many love to wallow in darkness, or to be in darkness. Not just literally, but spiritually. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So, I'm not going to get off on too much of a tangent here, but this is just another example of what you get. If you put your trust in men, if you love darkness and you want to trust somebody else to teach you, this is what you're going to get. This is the de uh, definition of Leviathan. So God tells us about Antichrist. The world tells us about serpents, sea monsters, dragons, crocodiles, as it says in the Catholic New Revised Standard Reversion, or the crocodile. Let's not forget about the crocodile. Where did the word rapture come from as it relates to Christian doctrine? Because no one seems to know. Of course no one seems to know. Because flesh loves darkness. The word rapture, as it relates to a Christian doctrine, comes from the Jesuit Dewey Reams Bible of 1610. And it is also to be taken up to heaven or to be carried away in spirit. So the Babylonians come up with a word that is not found in the canon of scripture. And it's a flattering word that says, you know something, KJV community? You guys are so righteous. You... You don't drink alcohol, yet, yeah, we're going to give you a little bit of food. You're going to be a little gluttony there. A lot of you are going to be overweight, especially you independent Baptists, whatever. But you're going to be raptured. God loves you so much. You guys have the truth. Don't worry about the Bible. You're not going to be here. And, guys, I'm not making a joke out of this. I've heard this from independent Baptist pulpits preached out of guys coming out of seminaries. Where are they getting this from? I'm asking a rhetorical question. This is the wisdom of the world. Okay? The word rapture never meant anything to do with any Christian doctrine. At least you can look up to the time of the, before the uh, Oxford movement, before 1830. Okay? This is all yet another wave of delusion that's ultimately coming from the Most High because people give concessions to the word of God, and they don't seek God out the way they should. 
says in Jeremiah chapter 5, For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. I don't know too many Christians that understand that we're in a horrible famine right now, not of bread, but of hearing of the words of God, as it says in the book of Amos. And how many people do you know that are true Christians that, that think evil is going to come upon us? God says, Jesus Christ tells us that this tribulation that's going to happen will be horrifying, unlike anything the world has ever seen before. And there won't be, it's going to be so bad that God's never going to allow it to happen again. And if we're judging by our own unrighteous judgment and we look around, we see a world that, yeah, we've got our problems and conflicts, but, you know, overall, you know, it's going to be okay. You don't see what God is telling you through spiritual vision unless you're born again of the Spirit. The truth is, is that the Egyptians, the Babylonians, are, are going to ultimately give in power by God to have sword and slay with the sword, both naturally and spiritually, caused by a great famine. And it's going to be horrifying. We, we're already getting persecuted as Christians today. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But if you think you're going to be raptured out of here, as, as the Catholic Bible seems to imply, using rapture as a word, uh, to indicate taken up into heaven or carried away in spirit, and you believe this is going to happen before tribulation, that really doesn't fit with what Jesus Christ's testimony is when he says that all will suffer tribulation. Something to think about, but the important thing here is light and darkness. Which light do you have? God loved us even though our deeds are evil and we love darkness. As I mentioned earlier, God says that men love darkness and our deeds are evil. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but it says in Luke chapter 23, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. In so, very important that as Jesus Christ dies for our iniquities, our darkness, God causes a literal darkness to happen as well. He is the light of the world, and the light is going out because he had to die to pay for our sins. And this is another great passage of scripture that was suggested to me to put in this presentation, so thank you very much. But the contrast of light and darkness is found everywhere from Genesis through Revelation, and this is another great passage that gives us a lesson here. In Psalm 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if you are a saved Christian, God's word gives light to your feet and your path. You can see, now if that happens naturally, if you've ever been out at nighttime, whether it's in the woods or whether it's just somewhere that's really, really dark, and I've been to extremely dark places. I've been up on mountaintops that are so isolated from civilization that you can see, uh, you know, a thousand times more stars than what you can uh, in most places that are uh, in city or suburban areas. Uh, so I can understand, like you guys probably can, complete darkness in a natural sense. When you have a lamp under your feet and a light under your path, it's kind of like having a flashlight where you can shine the flashlight in front of you so you can see where you're going. You don't shine it behind you, usually, because it's not as useful. You shine it where you're going so that you have vision so you don't step on a rock and fall down a cliff, for example. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 14, we know Lucifer wants to be like the Most High. So the God of this world wants to emulate everything that the Most High does. In Revelation chapter 8, it says, burning as it were a lamp. So Lucifer comes up with his own corrupt version of God's word, ultimately is what it is. And it's called wormwood. And we know that Antichrist, in order to facilitate this process, creates confusion. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. 
So Antichrist creates a flood uh, by the power of Satan, ultimately given unto him by the Most High for those that don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and creates confusion, floods the world, as it says in the book of Revelation. Carried away the woman, those that would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in the imagination of their hearts. Uh, and so this is important to review again because lamp represents light. And Lucifer has a counterfeit light, which is darkness to God. Jesus Christ says in Psalm 18, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. This is in reference to God. God is giving an account of himself. Lucifer wants to be like God. False Christ, out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. This is emulation. This is Lucifer wanting to be like the Most High. And God is telling us about this. So, there is a counterfeit light in this world that is darkness to God. God says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord. So we associate God's word with fire, and you know if you've been around a campfire at night, fire gives light. And lamps have fire. They have a flame coming out of them. And out of God's mouth, flames are because the lamp, the light of the world. In Exodus chapter 23, it says, And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise, and perverteth the words of the righteous. I mentioned earlier in spiritual vocabulary, that a gift is, is a Christ. Now you've got many false Christ in this world, and many come saying that Jesus is Christ and deceive many. Okay, um, So associate gifts with false Christ, or a Christ. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, And thou shalt grope at noondays, as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shall not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. God is warning people that if they don't believe on him, they're going to be groping in the natural light, but they're going to be blind to his spiritual light. They're going to be walking in darkness because they don't believe in God. They don't believe in God's word. Okay, They've got false gifts says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So Jesus Christ is a free gift, a free gift of salvation, eternal life. There's no copyright. There's no God doesn't charge because none of us have any currency to offer God. We don't have anything that he will accept short of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in order to understand light versus darkness, we need to understand what a gift is. Because you have a good gift and a bad gift. The really real gift that matters in this world is giving people the truth of the gospel and sharing the testimony of Jesus Christ. God does the rest of the work. And if he chooses to take the hardness off of a person's heart, and open their eyes so that they're no longer blind and that they receive the light of the gospel, that's God's choice. Because salvation is an acceptance of the individual believing the Lord Jesus Christ and also God assessing whether that person is a true believer and sending the Holy Spirit to that person. It's not Jesus, you know, I make you my Savior. It's God ultimately sends the Holy Spirit to those that are true believers. Back to Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So once again, we've got the light of God's word that is mentioned here. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, the light of the body is the eye. So remember, I talked about how the eye is symbolic of wisdom. Okay, you've got your natural body and your spiritual body. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So if your wisdom 
is single, meaning it's coming from God, and you don't have wisdom that is natural and spiritual. You're not trusting yourself and somebody else. You're trusting only God. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the men. Then the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, in other words, your natural, your, your wisdom is the wisdom of the world, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Something to think about, because again, God is talking about light in the context of a false light given by Lucifer. A light that causes people to lean on their own natural understandings. In Ezekiel chapter 28, it says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. God is talking about the king of Babylon, the king of Tyrus. He's using the name Tyrus to confound those that are wise. He's talking about Lucifer, the anointed cherub. And he's telling us that um, Lucifer was created full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, and he has corrupted his own wisdom by reason of his brightness. Lucifer has light, he has brightness, but he's given a false corrupt light to the world for those that want to believe on him, and God gives him the title, the God of this world. So, continuing that theme, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So once again, God is telling us about how he chooses delusions. And so, in this case, we can't see... The tree of death is blocking the faith in Jesus Christ, blinding the minds of the lost. Can you see the false prophet on the tree cut down? Well, it's probably not easy to see the false prophet at first. And this is like a natural person uh, looking at the world through their own eyesight. But when you get saved, God gives you spiritual vision. And I'm going to do my best to try to give an example of what that is like so that people can relate to what it's like being a reborn Christian that has spiritual sight that is not slumbering. Okay, so now you can see the scorpion on the ground very easily because you have the light of the world in you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the wisdom of men, but Jesus Christ, his light. He's protecting you from the false light of Lucifer, and you can see corruption uh, through his power, his vision. It says in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tale. So you can understand spiritually that uh, a scorpion is also symbolic of a false prophet, and you associate tail with that as well. So back when God tells you in Job chapter 40, he moveth his tail like a cedar, you understand that Lucifer is manipulating false prophets in his Bibles as God continues the lesson in Ezekiel chapter 17. Okay, that's all God is talking about. So instead of like a big dinosaur wagging his tail as the wisdom of the world teaches. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, O death, where is thy sting? If you can see false prophets and you can reprove them by God's power using his word, uh, Death has no dominion over you. Night creatures. Loving darkness. Again, unfortunately, the topic here is, is uh, heavily dependent on darkness because the vast majority of people just love darkness. They, don't, they have not been able to come to the light of the gospel for whatever reason. Lack of faith is ultimately the root cause. So God uses other symbols such as owls which represent devils uh, in Isaiah chapter 13, Revelation chapter 18, uh, satyrs which are also devils. Uh, you can see that place in scripture. The reason I bring this up is we can't forget that this world is occupied by fallen angels which God calls devils and they can manifest themselves in different 
physical forms. Um, we know that. We've got the king of Babylon shape-shifting in Daniel chapter 4, for example, into forms of a lion, uh, a man, uh, uh, an eagle, and, uh, and uh, eating grass as an ox, for example. So uh, we live in a world where there are physical manifestations of fallen angels as well. Not that we have to obsess on it, but we are not ignorant of Satan and his devices. So this is part of understanding light versus darkness. You've got a wild contrast here, and we that follow the light of God's word are not ignorant to the evil realities of this world. In Job chapter 41, regarding Antichrist, he maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Very basic teaching. Antichrist can't show you your vision ahead. He can't see the future himself, although God may send him a delusion uh, so that he thinks he can. But he only sees behind him what has already happened. So I show an image of Pharaoh with a path as he's walking towards darkness. He's got a path that's lit after him. Unlike a Christian who has a light in front of them, uh, the heathens, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, they can only look behind and see what's happened because they're following a blind guide. Okay, that, that they believe, you know, Leviathan is a crocodile. And I show the crocodile looking up to the second part of the verse. One would think the deep to be hoary. What is the deep? The deep is the counsel in the heart of man. Hoary means ancient. So, we, men, like to think that we've got the most ancient text available, such as the Vatican manuscript that tell us the truth of God's word, and that's what the crocodile is looking up at, what the world says the most ancient is, rather than trusting the preserved word of God where the manuscripts were copied perfectly over the ages and translated faithfully, ultimately by God's power, using fallible men. Uh, you know, so this is a contrast. You've got the world in darkness with only a light behind them. Uh, and you've got God, who is Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who can shine a light in our paths in front of us, as it says in Psalm 119. So I wanted to make this point here because there is so much depth in God's word to the contrast between darkness and light. I wanted to give this example as well. In John chapter 7, it says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. This is very important. I'm going to make this point. Uh, it says in Jeremiah chapter 5, Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Every one that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased." You don't have the protection. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, God gives you some protection in this world. But that protection is going to be limited based on what God's will is. And at some point, if you're not listening to God, if you're stiff-necked, God may lift that protection to the point where you'll be slain, uh, torn into pieces even. Now this has happened, and I don't want to get fixated on it, but I can't tell you how many accounts I have read of people that are mostly professing pagans that go on these retreats where they, you know, worship false gods or they just go on their new age journeys and they're slain, torn to pieces out in the wilderness. Where you, you hear about this every once in a while in the papers. I don't obsess on it. All it is is a fulfillment of God's word. But I will also say this, and um, please, if you're a young person or someone that's easily offended by... Uh, let's say, scary things, pause and stop watching this video now and fast forward about five minutes. Okay, I'm going to continue by saying I know people, I've talked to people directly on a number of occasions that have given accounts of real werewolves hunting them down. Okay, one werewolf came to an apartment of a person and wanted to kill them. But this person was Christian and had their Bible with them, and the werewolf 
could not harm them. Another person, a werewolf, came to their house. And when I mean werewolf, I'm talking about a literal eight or nine foot tall werewolf and could not get into their house because of their faith. I myself, have I seen werewolves? I have seen what I think are werewolves. I'll leave it at that. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. I'm not here to prove anything. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But we are not ignorant of Satan and his devices. This world is much different as you look at it through the eyes of a Christian who sees through the light of the Lord Jesus Christ than one that sees and judges by just their own unrighteous judgment, by what their natural understandings and natural vision tells them. So God warns, if you don't have the protection of Jesus Christ, uh, this, this could be very tragic, and it has been tragic for some people. And as I mentioned earlier, we live in a world uh, where uh, Lucifer and the fallen angels have been cast down, and they can manifest as physical objects and physical creatures. Um, and uh, we can't judge by what we see. We judge a righteous judgment according to the word of God. I don't have any concern whatsoever about um, any of this in terms of harming me. My protection is of the Lord's. When my time is ready, it's because the Lord has spoken it. And in the meantime, I'm not going to be scared, but I'm not going to be stupid and put myself and seek out evil either. I'm not going to wish that evil comes upon anyone, and I'm not going to seek it out. But I'm not ignorant of Satan and his devices. I'm going to go back to the theme again. Light versus darkness. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Lucifer wants to be like the Most High. As I mentioned before, burning as it were a lamp, wormwood, out of his mouth go burning lamps. I'm repeating this slide here for a reason, because where this is leading up to is you've got a final ecumenical Bible that God has really taught us all about, light versus darkness, all throughout Scripture. And the name of this final ecumenical Bible is called Wormwood, and it burns as it were a lamp, okay, as it were God's word, and God says that an assembly of nations will bring it forth. So is world government planning to unite humanity under one prayer book? Think about what God teaches in the A.V. 1611 and how Babylon has changed the words in their merchandise to hide prophecy. I mean, this is all possible that people aren't aware of this because of all the counterfeit scriptures, which are the flood out of the serpent's mouth, according to Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. So, this final ecumenical Bible, God teaches us all about this. Many, many, many places in Scripture. Who knows about it? So, I've given this example before. This is just one of many examples I have where you've got an assembly if, in the United Nations where somebody says, therefore, as a last sort of concrete idea, I would like to propose that we work to establish a new liturgy a new prayer book that all people can use regardless of their religion. Okay, I've gone through this before. This is just one example. God is putting his will in their hearts. God is the one who, who uh, creates the light and the darkness, who makes peace and makes creates evil. He does all things. He forms the light. He creates darkness. He divides. And he's going to allow the slayer to slay with sword and famine. Because he's spoken it. And so we need to take heed to what God says. And then you can see very simply in this world that this theme keeps coming up over and over and over. The world keeps announcing this ecumenical prayer book all the time. But you can't see it without the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just give one more example without getting on a long uh a long rant about this, you know, you, you go through time, I've got examples going back probably 35 years where they keep coming up with this, oh, we've got, we, we can't believe any Bible, we, we keep, you know, we, get, we need one Bible to unite everyone. This is a common theme that I've seen about every few years they come out with these types of announcements, but it doesn't get front page headlines because God doesn't want it to get front, front page headlines. He's He's going to choose delusions and send them to people. 
for not believing on his word. But this is just one Vatican in shock. I'm trying not to laugh. I mean, really? They're in shock as a 1,500-year-old Bible claims Jesus wasn't crucified? Uh, uh, my opinion is the God of this world, Lucifer, who controls the media, he's the prince, the power of the air, you know, is allowed to put this nonsense out. You know, they, they come up with these antiquities. It's a strategic plan. Now we're being sold the lie that after all this time, after all this persecution, oh, Jesus wasn't crucified. Well, in my Bible, Jesus was crucified, and the Holy Spirit teaches me out of the 1611. I can say that with full conviction. So why would I want to trust anything else? Yet this is yet another example of the media just throwing out stuff to, to people who have a natural understanding. There's no light in them of God's power, and they'll swallow up anything, as God says. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So my comment would be all slumbered and slept in Matthew chapter 25, the saved as well as the unsaved. But let's not be like them. Let's watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. This is a spiritual drunkenness. Look at the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Stay me with flagons, I am sick of love. God is love. I am sick of the God of this world, Lucifer, who's made me sick because I'm drunk on flagons of wine. That's what's going on in the song, okay? And that's what God is referring to here. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. You need the whole armor of God, as it says in the book of Ephesians. Okay? For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, we're not going to suffer wrath of God by being cast in the lake of fire for eternity, but we're going to get saved because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. God is reminding us of the good news that even if you're in a spirit of slumber, as long as you have oil in your lamp and you're still sleeping, we should live together with him, that you'll be saved. But you don't want to suffer loss in your judgment. So you don't want to be slumbering. You don't want to be found to be slumbering. You want to give your household meat in due season. You want to feed your family, friends, and everyone else that God puts in your life with the word of God and trust that God will open up uh, their hearts to receiving the truth of his word open them up to salvation by taking the hardness off their hearts so in conclusion it says in revelation chapter 22 and there shall be no night there and they need no candle neither light of the sun for the lord god giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever so in contrast well, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, a few verses into Scripture. God divides the light from the darkness, and the light was good. And you go through the entire account of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you get near the end in the last chapter of the Bible, and you see the reward of those that believed on Jesus Christ, that they will um, have light, the Lord will give them light, and they'll reign forever and ever in eternal life. There shall be no night there. Now, I understand the natural, literal account, but most importantly to me, the spiritual account that there will be no more doubt about who God is and his word being true, that there will be the light of the gospel forever and ever, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and we will always uh, walk in his precepts. That's what gives me joy that there is great hope in salvation, and there is light in the gospel, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you guys for watching this longer lesson, and I really trust that it's been a great topic for me to cover, the great contrast between light and darkness. I want to thank again my friend who uh, collaborated with me on this sermon and gave me uh, many passages of scripture to consider. Uh, it was a great blessing, and I truly hope that
this will help many people with their education and ultimately lead them to being better witnesses to getting the truth of the word out to people that are in need and in darkness.